In this video, we explain the concept of a reversible isothermal gas expansion. All right, we're trying to calculate uh, what is the work done when a gas, when a gas expands against an external pressure. Uh, there is a parent expression for the calculation of that work that we have derived, which is this one, and that always for that, uh, this will always work. Okay, so it really doesn't matter how the expansion is. Uh, you can always use that expression. However, we're seeing how this expression spawns uh, new expressions depending on the conditions um, with, under which you, ca you can carry that expansion. So in the last video we have seen what happens when uh, you carry out an expansion against a constant external pressure. Now what we do here is ask the question, uh, what is the maximum work that you can do in a gas expansion? Okay, so again, the concept here is that work is something useful, right? So for any particular process, you like to extract as much of the energy as work as possible. And for gas expansions, the way to do that is uh, the way that we're going to explain it right here, which is uh, doing it in something that is called a reversible uh, way. Okay, so let's see how that works. Now notice that in this expression, you can always get uh, the largest possible work, uh, or you could in principle get a very large amount of work if this ex constant external pressure is very large, right? The largest the constant ex external pressure is, the more work you're going to extract. However, there is a limit uh, uh, to that value of the uh, external pressure, uh, and that is that limit is given because you can't have uh, uh, an external pressure that is larger than the pressure of the gas. Because if the external pressure is larger than the pressure of the gas, then you won't expand. Okay, so let's try to illustrate that with uh, uh, simple numbers. Okay, suppose that you have here a gas, right here, uh, that is at uh, maybe uh, two atmospheres of pressure. And you want to expand it and ex extract the maximum amount of work. Right, so the question is, well, uh, uh, you, want, you would like to use an external pressure that is as large as possible but not too large, so that it actually compresses the gas rather than expanding it. Okay, so it looks like, well, if you have here a pressure of uh, two atmospheres, an external pressure of two atmospheres, right, that is actually your upper limit for how large the pressure can be. If the pressure, uh, external pressure turns into 2.01 atmospheres, then you would actually be compressing the gas, which means that you're not extracting any work. All right, so, so instead, uh, what you have to do is make this, this uh, external pressure a little bit less than the internal pressure so that you can actually carry it out. Okay, so for example, suppose that you actually make it be maybe 1.99 atmospheres, right? And in that case, you can actually carry out the expansion, right? But the expansion then uh, would happen until uh, the volume increases by just a little bit so that the pressure drops to 1.99 atms as you're expanding and that means that you reach the external pressure and uh, that's the end of the expansion. You can't get any more work out of this, right? Uh, but of course, we like to expand this much more, right? We like to expand this macroscopically so that you, you can actually extract a significant amount of work, right? So, well, maybe what you can do the next is say, well, what I can do now is change the external pressure by just a little bit so that it actually yeah. becomes a little bit smaller and then I can continue to carry out this expansion, right? So if I vary the external pressure and now let it drop to 1.98, then the internal pressure is larger than the external pressure momentarily, and I can continue to do this, right? Uh, so now you're, you're expanding a little bit more, right? So the volume is increasing a little more. That means that the pressure drops a little bit, and now you equalize with external pressure and so forth, right? So you can continue to do this uh, in, in a series of steps uh, until you actually get to your macroscopic expansion. Proceeding this way, you're actually guaranteeing that at each point of the expansion, you're pushing against the largest possible pressure that you can still expand and not compress. Okay, there's another way to do this, which is a little bit more elegant, uh, and we can uh, write uh, in just a little bit, right? So a way to do this processing with your uh, adjusting the external pressure a little bit at a time so that uh, the external pressure is always just slightly lower 
than the internal pressure of the gas and you can expand is to consider the following setup. Right, so suppose that you start here with your gas. Uh, this is your uh, initial pressure. And then the external pressure is provided by an infinite number of infinitesimal masses, right? So you have here an infinite number of masses, tiny little masses, that are actually uh, infinitesimal. Okay, so uh, initially there's a uh, mechanical equilibrium, right? So there's, there's no expansion, but then what you can do is just remove one of these infinitesimal masses. Right? When you remove one of those infinitesimal masses, then what happens is that the external pressure becomes instantaneously infinitesimally smaller than the internal pressure, and then you can uh, expand, right? So there's going to be a tiny little bit of expansion that takes place, so this volume should be a little larger when you remove one of the masses, okay? At that point, you reach thermal equilibrium, but of course you can now remove another one of the tiny little masses and expand a little bit more, right? So that volume goes up a little bit when you remove uh, the second of the masses. And just like that, you can continue to remove masses until you come to the last one. Okay, so uh, we're actually going to now uh, take this volume to a much larger value, right? Because you have been expanding progressively until you just have one mass left. And then eventually, uh, if you remove that mass, you can get to the last point of the expansion, okay, which will be that one. Uh, and that will be kind of the end of it. Okay, notice that this is an idealized process. It would take an infinite amount of time to take uh, out of these little masses because there's an infinite number of them. Okay, so this is an idealized process, but it's one in which uh, at each step, you're always pushing against the largest possible pressure that you can have under those conditions, and that gives you maximum work. Okay, so uh, uh, there's a way to actually calculate with numbers. Uh, how much work you're getting out of this, and that is going to provide a useful upper limit for the maximum work that you can extract. Again, this is never realizable in, in real conditions because you can never take an infinite amount of time, but still, if you devise something that is possible, right, this will be a benchmark against which to calibrate how good your process is, okay, because this gives you the maximum possible work. Okay, now that we understand a little bit better what a reversible expansion is, now we're actually going to try to see if we can come up with an equation to figure out this upper limit for the maximum work that you can extract from a gas expansion. Okay, so let's try to see if we can uh, do that. We'll keep this uh, picture in our mind. All right, so uh, something that is uh, special about this expansion is that the external pressure is no longer constant, right, because you're removing those masses on top of the piston at its time, the pressure is changing all the time. It's actually becoming smaller and smaller, and that means that that pressure is not constant. So now we're not going to be able to take it out of the integral. Okay, but let's see how that works out. Okay, notice that uh, at each of these uh, individual uh, points that we have right here, all right, what happens is something quite important. This is kind of the definition of this reversible expansion, right? When you remove one of those masses, what happens is that the external pressure is almost equal to the internal pressure, except that it's a little bit smaller, right? That's, the, that's kind of the condition so that the uh, uh, expansion can proceed, right? This number has to be a tad smaller than the pressure of, uh, of the gas, right? So that's the tad smaller number, and that's something that is important, because now we can come here to this equation and say, well, that is going to be equal to minus the internal pressure of the gas minus differential of P, okay, from V1 to V2, differential of V. Okay, so uh, that is actually going to uh, make the integration much, much simpler, as we're going to see in just a little bit. Right? We can take this expression now and say, well, I'm going to um, develop that into uh, two expressions, so that is going to be equal to the integral from V1 to V2 of the internal pressure differential of V uh, plus the integral from V1 to V2 of differential of P differential of V, but of course that's the product of two differentials, which means that this is going to be a small number that can be completely neglected, 
Okay, so what we're actually left out with is this internal pressure of the gas. Okay, so uh, this is actually the pressure of the gas, all right? And uh, that pressure is changing, which means that uh, you cannot take it out of the integral. And again, we, we can drop that internal subscript because it's the pressure of the gas, and we know that this is an ideal gas. Now, we know that this pressure is changing, uh, but we actually know that if this is an ideal gas, we actually can cast this uh, 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 pressure, we can reformulate it as a function of the volume of the gas, right? Because for an ideal gas, we have that this applies. Okay? So that's very useful because then we're going to be able to actually have a dependence on the volume into that uh, integral, and that will make the integration very straightforward. Okay, so let's actually then do that. Notice that if we apply now here the ideal gas equation of state, V1 to V2, we'll have nRT over V, V fractional of V. And again, this is an expression that is quite simple to integrate. Okay, to see how, we recognize that in the gas expansions that we're uh, working with, the number of moles is constant. So this is actually, this can be factored out of the integral. R is also constant, so it also comes out. And we are considering that the process is isothermal, right? That is a condition that we have right here. So the temperature also factors out of the integral, right? So that, that's going to make it very simple for us, right? That is going to be minus nRT, the integral of differential of V over V from V1 to V2. And that is an integral that is very accessible, that is just a natural log. Okay, so we come here and say that is minus nRT and evaluate the limits already. That is going to be simply the natural log of V2, the final volume over the initial volume of the gas. This is the expression for work in an irreversible isothermal gas expansion. And again, this is a, a very useful expression because it gives you the maximum work that you can get out of a gas expansion. All right, so to flesh out a little bit this knowledge, we're actually going to compute uh, exactly how what the work that you can extract in this gas expansion is if you carry out reversibly an isothermal Right, so what that would mean is that we would actually put here an infinite number of infinite decimal masses and then remove one at a time and then uh, try to extract work, work from that. Okay, so let's see how that works. All right, so again, as always, we're going to try to use here SI units, which means that my temperature has to be in Kelvin, R has to be in joules per mole per Kelvin, that's moles. Uh, here we actually, the, the units of the volumes that, uh, don't matter uh, because they're gonna cancel each other out so we can actually use liters. Now, using the same numbers as we had for the uh, problem in the prior video, where we have done this against the constant external pressure uh, of one atmosphere, we get that those numbers are minus 2.00 mole. Now, uh, R in SI units is 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. The temperature is 298 Kelvin. And then the volumes, because they're divided by each other, the units are actually uh, irrelevant here. So we can use uh, the liters. So 20.0 liters is the final volume, over 10.0 liters is the initial volume. And this number happens to be minus 3.43, 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, and this is an important number uh, because that is the maximum amount of work that you can extract from this uh, particular gas expansion. Now, if you compare this number to the one that we have obtained against the constant external pressure of one atmosphere, that number was 1.01, .01, 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, so from this reversible process, we're extracting almost three and a half times more work than if we simply were pushing here against one atmosphere of pressure. Okay, so, so that illustrates the concept or, or the, the point here, uh, which is quite important about reversible gas expansions, and that is that they do provide maximum work. Okay, so uh, uh, that's kind of the, the whole point of these processes. To wrap this up, we can say that, again, reversible gas expansions or reversible processes in general uh, tend to be idealized uh, processes uh, and, and uh, they're impossible to carry out. However, 
uh, in the case of a reversible gas expansion, it provides an upper limit for, uh, it provides a benchmark for the maximum worth that you can get. In reality, when you actually try to carry out a gas expansion, you're going to devise a procedure that tries to get as close to this number as possible. You will never be able to go over it, but the closest you can get to that number, the better your gas expansion is.